Right, so let's, let's go. So um, T is why open source is vital and uh, it's smaller, but actually this is a very exciting fun bit. This is, uh, we're going to talk about this as well. Uh, so what is trust? What's T using T is open source and T is that? I want to get moving, so I'm not going to hang around on this. So uh, I spent a lot of time talking about trust uh, and thinking about trust over the last ooh, 20 years. Um, and this is a definition that I've, I've come up with over the years. Trust is the assurance that one entity holds that another will perm, perform particular actions according to specific expectation. We'll come back to this in a bit. But when you search on Pixabay for trust, you get this picture, which is, I think, an African land squirrel being trusted not to bite a child's nose off. Um, this is a bad example of a trust relationship. <laughs> okay. So let's think about what you can trust. This is a, a simplified standard stack, right? We all know what this looks like. Everyone, everyone happy with this? It's a representation of a stack. Good, good, good. Okay. So you have a problem. So you write the application, right? So you, you've got some trust you do that. But it's sitting on top of middleware. And you didn't write the middleware, and there's every opportunity that someone may have got something wrong, or done something wrong on purpose, or just done bad things. So, but it sits on top of R, ah, user space. Um, no one ever hacks anything in user space, right? That never goes away. So that's, okay, well, we better not trust that. But the kernel, we can trust that, hmm, we have over the years come across some problems with kernel. Luckily, there's the boot, ah. You can see where I'm going with this, right? So, um, hypervisor, entirely safe, firmware, ha, ha, right. Okay, so we have a bit of a problem. Assuming that you wrote the application and you trust that, what do we do? If we actually want to run stuff on a computer, which I guess most of us are interested in doing, um, it would be nice to find a way around some of these problems. And the CPU vendors realized that we and they had a problem. It's a turtle problem. Who knows the turtle story? Oh, I'll get to tell the turtle story. Right, okay. So, um, this is told about a variety of people, but it's someone like George Bernard Shaw or someone like that in the early years of the 20th century. And in those days, people used to go around, scientists, eminent persons, usually men, going and lecturing to people about science and, and philosophy and, and how the world worked. And um, George Bernard Shaw, whoever it was, went to a, to a packed uh, audience, auditorium, I think, in the north of England, and explained about uh, cosmology and evolution and uh, you know, how everything works and you know, the, the dinosaurs and straw and all of this. And it went down very well. Huge applause at the end. And at the end, he was receiving questions. And an old lady came up to him and said, um, that was fascinating, Mr. Shaw, um, but of course it's all rubbish. And he said, well, what do you mean it's all rubbish? And, uh, and, and he, she said, well, everybody knows uh, that the earth sits on top of a turtle. And he said, okay. And he said, ah, but what, what does a turtle sit on? She said, don't be stupid. It's turtles all the way down. And the, the moral of the story, is, which is used by security people, is that in the end, you have to have a bottom turtle. You have to have a turtle that you can trust and you can build stuff on. And that's what the CPU vendors realized fairly recently. And they, so they created TEEs. TEEs are trusted execution environments. They are um, chip level instructions which basically allow you to run an application in memory which nobody else can see. Not the kernel, not the hypervisor, not someone with pseudo access. None of these people, none of these entities. And this gives us something we can work on. So some examples that are in the public domain, AMD have one called SEV, which stands for something, secure something, something. Um, Intel has something called SGX, which stands for secured guard extensions. Um, IBM has something called PF, which stands for protected something, something. Um, and... The definite, I'm sorry, we look them up. This is not the interesting bit of the talk, okay? We're getting to that. Um, so we have a definition of, uh, of, of what a, a TE is. And it, we call it a hardware-based technique for securing sensitive data. So this is key, right? 
Anything that you don't trust to be on the public cloud or on, frankly, any old system where Joe Random Hacker can, uh, can look at your patent data or your payroll data or your financial data or your health data. So secure and sensitive data and algorithms. Okay? This is not just stuff at rest. We've typically in the past thought of uh, securing and encrypting um, data at rest, on basically storage, in transit, basically over the network. But this is a third type. This is for in process. So it's being processed. So algorithms as well as the data. In such a way that even the kernel or the root user or the hypervisor can't see what's going on. So that's our definition of a TE. It does cut out a couple of uh, technologies. Um, an HSM is not a TE. A TPM is not a TE. Um, can you emulate them in various ways with a TE? Yes. Would you want to? They perform different functions generally. We could be happy to talk about that another time. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, so ARM trust owner is not a TE, TPM is not a TE. Using TEs. Do you have any sensitive data? Nod. You have sensitive data. Do you have any sensitive algorithms? Well, maybe you don't, but I'm sure that your banks and your healthcare providers do. Do you trust your cloud provider with them? Are you happy to hand over? All of the, thank you for shaking your head at the back, sir. That's, that's, you're quite right. You should not trust your cloud provider with those things. Um, but you can trust all your sysadmins, can't you? No? No. Okay, fine. Um, and do you trust the entirety of your software stack? Are you sure that all of those things I had there, completely safe, have not been compromised and are entirely safe to be trusted? No, no. Do be quiet, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Jones. He's a troublemaker in the front. He's got a beard as well. So if you answered no to any of these, then you need TEEs. Uh, and I did a, a pretty picture for the video. All of these things are things you might be wanting to put in a TEE. Um, open source, if you're going to use a TE in open source, there's a bunch of things we need, right? We need that user space support. We need kernel space support. Once we've got those, we actually need applications that use them, right? Just saying we've got a set of, uh, of hardware-based instructions, CPU-based instructions, uh, and now you can program them, is great if you love assembly, but not many of us write assembly for fun anymore. There was a time. We need to get them into DevOps and hybrid cloud so people actually write stuff and use them and deploy them. And here's the problem. If we don't make them, the proprietary people will. You know, Linux is winning at the moment. Yeah? Open source is winning at the moment. But if the... Uh, Enterprises out there see ways of keeping their stuff safe in proprietary software, but not in open source software, they will use the proprietary stuff. So we need to up our game and do some stuff. So this is where my uh, beautiful assistant takes over. Unluckily, all I've got is Nathaniel, so uh, I'll let him do it. Right, go. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, my name is Nathaniel, and uh, I'm the technical lead on the NRX project. And the NRX project's goal is to build uh, precisely what Mike was talking about. Um, and uh, you can see we have a website, nrx.io, pretty easy to find. And a logo and stickers. Yes, there are stickers at the Red Hat booth. Um, I think Mike might even have some Absolutely. as well. So, uh, so you can get stickers. I know that's the most important part of the talk. Um, <clears throat> But so basically we're just going to summarize precisely what Mike talked about, which is that we have this stack and the, each different color represents a different trust relationship uh, in, a, in a traditional stack, right? Um, and the, uh, the, the big section usually uh, is in red because that kind of stuff kind of comes from an operating system vendor, uh, particularly Red Hat, of 
course, uh, ships um, ships this stack. And so at least you have one trust relationship there, and this is the way people have traditionally mitigated their, uh, their risk uh, surrounding trust. Um, but we still have a bunch of other people you have to trust as well, like the firmware and the BIOS and, and the CPU. And uh, they all need to be trustworthy for your application to be trustworthy. So uh, this is what happens when we do containers. Uh, containers actually make the problem much worse in terms of trust. Now, I'm not saying that containers are horrible and you shouldn't use them. There's lots of good reasons to use containers, um, but they do increase the complex complexity of our trust relationships. Um, because typically you now have a user space that's coming within your container, uh, which is not part of the container host, uh, and so we now have different trust relationships there. And uh, XKCD gives us a really lovely illustration of this problem. Uh, they talk about the modern tech stack, and they're all compromised. Um, so uh, this is a, a fantastic uh, comic, by the way. If you don't know what XKCD is, uh, you should absolutely go uh, spend, like, at least eight hours of your life uh, going through the comics. And he gives permission for non-commercial use of his uh, pictures in this sort of way. So yep. uh, we did check. Yes. Okay, so we're going to give you a demo of uh, some some early functionality in the NRX project. This is not the totality of what we are building, um, but it is uh, a first step uh, in, in this goal. So uh, what you're going to see here is we're going to have... I'm going to, I'm going to stop you and say, what's the NRX project for? The NRX project aims to make it easy for you to write and deploy, deploy stuff into a TE. But we're not an application framework. Okay, so you're not going to write something specifically to NRX. You're going to write using standards, and you're going to deploy those standards using NRX. So what you're going to see today uh, is not that, unfortunately. We're, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. And what you're going to see is you're going to see uh, two entities, a client and a server. Uh, in this case, the server is a cloud host of some kind, and the uh, client is the tenant that wants to run some code on that host, but doesn't want to disclose any information about what is happening uh, inside their execution uh, to that host. So go ahead to the next one. Um, the first thing that's going to happen is that the uh, tenant is going to attest to the AMD firmware. And notice that this goes through the host. We're actually talking to the firmware on the box. Uh, it's true that the host is proxying that information, but that uh, information does have uh, integrity protection, so the host can't modify it and do malicious things. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it a bit more and say, what is attestation and why do we care? So what we care is that the AMD firmware is going to create one of these trusted execution environments using the chip instructions in a way that it's provably correct. Cryptographically, we can be cryptographically confident, can never be sure of anything, we can be cryptographically confident that it's a proper AMD chip and it is created, as expected, a proper TE, a secure VM that we can use. Thank you. Um, so, and, and this is happening directly to the hardware, right? So uh, we get that attestation, we validate that attestation cryptographically. We now know we're talking to genuine in AMD parts. We now that, know that we trust those parts to create this environment uh, for us exactly in the way that we expect. And then we're going to inject code into that uh, secure VM that's going to be launched. So we're going to deliver code and data encrypted into the VM. Because one of the things that we got from the attestation handshake was a lovely key, cryptographic key, which means that we can wrap our code and our data in such a way that nobody can look at it, including nobody on the host. So it goes straight into the secure VM where it's decrypted. So we've encrypted it with that special key, and now we're happy that we've delivered something into the host that it can't see. Absolutely. So uh, next up, we're going to do the demo. So uh, we're going we're gonna to play a video demo here. Um, we're going to run this command two times uh, with exactly the same inputs, okay? But we're going to get slightly different behavior, and I want you to pay attention to the slightly different behavior. So go ahead and play. Well, no. no. Uh, not that either. Um, Please bear with my associate here. He does have a hard time with computers. It is. They're complicated, um, complicated things. How do I get to work? Do I do that? You, I think you press the play button. There. There you go. So, uh, so yeah, we're going to run this. We're going to run this twice. Same inputs. We're going to take the numbers three and four, and we're going to add them together, and we're going to produce the number seven, okay? Which is which is correct output. Let me pause that for a second. So I'm sorry. Yeah, it's um, it's very small. Um, it's very small. Can we? I don't know if we can it, it uh, uh, Yeah, do that on the bottom, full screen. 
Yeah. How's okay. that? Let's run okay. it from the beginning again. Let's run it from the okay. beginning. And you still probably can't see it, but it is true, so it's fine. Yep. I've seen it happen in real time. It's okay. Time. You can trust us. It works. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so we're going we're gonna to run. Uh, notice that we're doing time, so we want to measure how long this takes. Uh, we're also going to run the command with two inputs, two numbers, the, uh, the number three and the number four. We're going to add those two numbers together, and uh, if my lovely assistant would point out the number seven uh, as output, uh, I think we all agree that three plus four is seven. Anybody disagree? Excellent. Okay, so uh, what, what actually happens here is, uh, the interesting that ha thing that happens here is not what we do, but how we do it, okay? So, uh, anyone can add three and four together, but instead what's happening is we are first fetching from the server a certificate chain. Uh, this is coming from the hardware, and one of the certificates in that chain has its private key burned into the CPU. There's no other way to access it. Uh, so we have the root certificate from AMD, we can validate the entire chain, which means that we now know that this is an AMD CPU. The chain is okay. The next thing that happens is that the client is going to craft its execution policy. This is what it's going to give to the firmware to say, this is how I want you to make this secure environment and these are the things I allow you to do. Uh, it's also going to calculate session keys. It's important to note that the session keys are generated on the client. We don't have to trust the server for ent entropy. The client is fully in charge of all entropy for the encryption. So uh, next, uh, we have uh, the server starts up the secure VM, and it provides a measurement of this VM. This, me this, this VM is empty. By empty, I don't mean it's like a blank Linux distribution. I mean there is not a single instruction, not a single CPU instruction in it yet. So we've, li we've literally measured emptiness. Uh, which should be the same across all uh, uh, executions, right? So the client gets this, gets this uh, measurement from the server and validates it. Uh, we now know cryptographically that the secure VM does not have any contents whatsoever. This means that there's no bootkit installed, there's no other uh, malicious instructions installed, so we, we know provably uh, through, through cryptography that it is uh, in fact empty. At this point, we are going to take our code, uh, which is some handcrafted assembly, adding the numbers three and four together. We're going to encrypt it using the session keys, and that's the actual code. Uh, it's encrypted, so you don't know what the code is, but that's the actual code. Uh, we're going to send that to the server. The server hands that, of course, to the firmware. The firmware decrypts that for us, injects it into the VM, and then finally we launch the VM. Our output comes the number seven. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question, uh, which is, can any of you guess why we chose the numbers three and four? You know. Anyone else want to guess? It's because Nathaniel couldn't be bothered to work out how to display two digits <laughs> when we got to here. We know that three and four add up to less than ten, and as we're working in binary, he was happy with that. It's basically because Nathaniel is lazy. Carry on, the Mike, you are very welcome to write a patch, and we will merge it. Uh, so. I will bear that in mind. Thank you. Carry on. Just put, dust off those assembly skills, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, anyway, like I said at the beginning, the interesting thing here is not what we do, but it's how we do it. Um, notice also that the execution time for this is 50 milliseconds. So this is something that we can do relatively quickly. Uh, it is not a big, when you think of uh, VMs, typically you think like I start the VM and then like a minute or two later it comes up. Uh, we are not talking about that here. We're talking about very rapid execution. But let's run the program Before again. Before we do that, yeah. I, want, I want people to uh, memorize this string, please, okay? If you want to take the first four digits, second four digits, th no, okay, fine. It's important though. Right, we're going to do exactly the same thing again. So now you would expect that if we ran the command uh, with exactly the same parameters, right, the code hasn't changed and the inputs have not changed, uh, therefore the code should be exactly the same. But notice that the uh, packet we actually deliver to the server is completely different. This is because we have perfect forward secrecy. So this uh, means that we are now resistant to uh, statistical-based uh, attacks uh, on the code, right? Nobody's going to be able to do statistical analysis and determine uh, what the code uh, runs, uh, giving, given all the other things being equal. So uh, that's why we run it twice. Notice that our, our time is also predictable. Of, uh, we're right about 50 milliseconds uh, in terms of execution. So uh, that's the end of the demo. 
And uh, this is not, we, we don't, uh, we do not expect to have you write assembly. That is not at all what our project is about. This is just simply where we are in our development process. Um, so, uh, so where we are, uh, what you just saw is this. We, so we, we did the attestation. We got that certificate chain. We validated that the hardware was who it claims to be. Uh, we then uh, delivered our code and data encrypted to the firmware, which injected it into the VM, ran our code, and we got our output. Okay. Um, so uh, we are calling these keeps. Uh, each different technology has a different terminology for their sort of insecure environment. Uh, Anarx has a term which we call keep, uh, which describes all of the environments as being operated in Anarx. This is currently AMD only, uh, but we are very close to getting uh, other technologies working. Uh, for example, we are now attesting SGX. We haven't delivered code into SGX yet, but we are we are now able to attest it. So I, I go, go a bit further just to explain about that. NARX is n one of the things about NARX is that it is intends to abstract away all the nasty things that you don't really need to want to know as a developer about your CPU architecture. Right? You don't care whether you're running on ARM or PowerPC or Intel. Or AMD, you shouldn't care. You're far too high up at that level. We want you to be right, able to write microservices or applications in C, C++, Java, Rust, Perl, one of my favorites, uh, Python, Haskell, and for it just to work. So we're abstracting all that stuff where you say, I want to keep, I want to know it's going to run safely in it, make it happen. So that is the point of Enox. Um, and as my Wonderful assistant said, we're not going to make you write assembly. So, yes. Uh, so, you, I was going to queue you up there with it. With what? The thing he said he wanted to talk about. Okay, we're talking about that today? We, well, let's, okay, do let, let's do it. Um, so, our actual goal is uh, not to run assembly, but WebAssembly. Uh, so, if you are familiar, how many are familiar with what WebAssembly is? Who okay, knows what good. JavaScript is? Anybody know what JavaScript is? Okay. Like. So JavaScript is slowly being eclipsed in the browser by WebAssembly. It allows you to write in your own language. You compile to WebAssembly, and you distribute that code to a browser. Every single browser supports it. Right? Uh, it, think about it this way. The largest decentralized computing network in the world is JavaScript. And JavaScript is being eclipsed by WebAssembly. Right? So we're on good technology, technological grounds here. We want you to be able to develop in whatever language you want. We're going to deliver that application into a keep, and you'll be able to execute it securely uh, using your own application development framework. This is, this is not uh, NARC. You're not developing to NARC. You're not going to be locked into NARC. You, d you uh, develop using standard APIs, and they all run uh, inside NARC. So uh, if we're successful, this is what we've done. We've removed all of these little, these middle layers. You still have to trust the CPU because you're executing code. You have to trust the CPU. Uh, what do you think is going to do your instructions if you don't trust the CPU? But right? that doesn't mean you have to trust all of the motherboard. Doesn't mean you need to cast, no, trust all of the uh, the memory buffers and stuff. Uh, yep. the, none of that. Yep. So you're you're trusting the CPU and the you know microcode and firmware for the CPU. Uh, but not from another vendor. Not as it's not a different trust relationship. You're still trusting the CPU and the firmware from a single vendor. Then you're trusting any middleware you include in your application because, well, you have to include middleware in your application. Um, and then finally, your application itself. But the entire middle layer uh, has been removed. And our plan is to make uh, NRX small and easily auditable and, of course, completely open source. Uh, I had to answer a question from a lawyer yesterday about an article I was writing about NRX and said it will always be open source. And she said, will it always be? Are you sure you can say that? I yes. Said, yes. Always open always source. Always open source. All good. Uh, Apache 2 for those people who are wondering. Yeah. Uh, so in this current code, there are, uh, I do want to be uh, completely transparent, there are some attack vectors, and uh, I want to disclose those. Uh, so there are some possible hypervisor attacks on the guest on current hardware. Um, the hardware we, we ran this on uh, was the Naples generation of AMD SEV, uh, and some of these have actually now been mitigated in the next version of the hardware. So this is, uh, I'm now talking about uh, AMD's uh, Rome chips, which were just announced. 
so the uh, the first or the first two attacks are roughly the same thing, which is that the hypervisor has full access to read and to write to the guest CPU registers, uh, which means that the uh, the hypervisor can see quite a bit of what's happening inside the VM and can tinker with it, which is uh, potentially just as dangerous. Um, so this is solved by uh, SEVES, which is no longer future AMD roadmap. This has now been announced. So uh, in the Rome generation of chips, uh, this is this is no longer a problem. Uh, we still don't have full software support for the strategies in these chips, but AMD is working to bring that upstream. So we should shortly uh, have a resolution to this problem. Um, number three is that there are uh, there are attacks uh, with moving memory pages. So the hypervisor could say uh, convince the guest to write some information to a page here and then move a page somewhere else and get the hypervisor to decrypt it in a, in, uh, in a different way. Uh, that is a possible attack from the hypervisor. And uh, the fourth uh, was a, uh, a vulnerability which we disclosed to AMD. And uh, that is the code that's executing allows the tenant to select, or excuse me, allows the host to select what, what uh, location in memory the encrypted code is decrypted to. And uh, we, we see a potential for attack at that place. However, our code is not vulnerable to that. Um, it, the way that we have designed the code, uh, but this is a, a potential problem. Both of these problems AMD uh, is working on, and if you would like more information on that, you could you can talk with AMD, uh, but we definitely expect uh, a, a future without these problems. So as we said before, this is AMD at the moment. The demo you've seen is on AMD, uh, but as Nathaniel mentioned, we are very close uh, to having similar functionality on SPX, and uh, it's not, I'm not going to suggest Lily is lazy. It's just she decided she had finished a, a, a thesis instead. Uh, <laughs> thought that was more important. So uh, we'll get there. We're, we're, we're nice and close. So we'll get there. Yeah, we've, it, we've got a really great team of developers. We're working on all of these different platforms. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We have a, a great, but very small team of developers and are always looking for people with an interest in doing this sort of stuff. So if you have expertise and an interest, please get in touch. You can go there. And find out all about the project. Sorry, big plug that was. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, what, where do you go to find out more? Edits on GitHub. Um, my, uh, this is really funny if you're a cryptographer. This is a really funny uh, name. My, I have a blog called Alice Even Bob. Mike is, likes to imagine himself clever, so just yeah. just engage him. It's well, I like to think, humor him. Let's convince other people that I am. Uh, and then he has a he has a blog as well. Then we have LinkedIn, and I'm on Twitter, and he refuses to admit he's on Twitter. Um, I think that is it. Yeah. Okay. So um, we'll make these available. The slides. Um, this is going to be big. People really care about this stuff. The industry is beginning to realise this is really important, and that we need to be able to make this happen. So um, please keep an eye out. And as I said, we're very interested uh, to talk to people. So, uh, open it up for questions. We've got about 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, wait for the microphone. I will talk into Mike's lapel. Actually, I think I'm just talking to this microphone. Is that on? Oh, yes. yes, it is. I will talk into this microphone. <laughs> Are there any limitations in terms of, like, size of the code you could send to the TE? Today, yes. Um, uh, in the future, I would. So all of the limitations are basically limitations that are uh, imposed by the hardware manufacturers. And I, as I would suspect, you would imagine hardware manufacturers are looking to increase those limits. And they, it, it, again, it, they are they they're different based on the different um, hardware vendors, and they've all said they're going to make changes. And what exactly those changes are, either either can't remember or can't tell you under NDA. So, so uh, yeah. So I, I can give you some public information. Um, currently on Intel chips, there is a limit to 96 megs of resident memory for SGX. Um, that number will disappear very soon uh, and will become a bigger number. A, a bigger number. Um, the uh, on uh, AMD, the current limitation on Rome is uh, there's 512 key slots, and I think 510 or 509 of them are usable for VMs, so you could have uh, 509 different instances. Um, 
th this number will also be in the future replaced by a larger number. So, um, and then uh, IBM is uh, has announced PEF, and uh, PEF has uh, some similar restrictions. I don't remember what they are off the top of my head, uh, but those will also be getting bigger as time goes on. So uh, hopefully you'll notice the trend here, right? They're starting small and getting bigger. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm back here, actually. Sorry, yeah. first. Yeah. I'm just curious. Uh, my question is, um, why do you say Amtrust Zone is not uh, TE? Because it basically allows parallel execution rather than execution in the main yeah it's so basically trust zone allows you to build a separate operating system rather than a separate child of an operating system and it's sort of a tool that you can use to build a TEE but it doesn't really have um, it's it seems to be more monitoring what the other operating system is doing rather than doing its own separate execution it doesn't and we we don't want you to build that, right? Like we 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 want you. We also don't want the, the so when Trust Zone gives you the ability to build that, it also means that everyone who builds it has a separate trust level, which doesn't really help us reduce the amount of parties we need to trust. Um, it also has extremely limited uh, constraints. I believe the limit, and uh, if you want to know more about this, uh, Patrick Uderweik is the guy to ask. Um, I believe the limit uh, for resident memory is only 10 megs, and there's really not a whole lot you can do in 10 megs. And that 10 megs is the entirety of the parallel operating system, not just your application. And, and we, we spoke to ARM, and they said, yeah, don't use that. Don't use trust to do this stuff. So. Another question I have is, um, what's the algorithm that you use, the encryption algorithm used in your it, development? It varies, but on AMD, it's, AMD, it, it's uh, AES 256. Yeah, so it, it's dependent on the on the manufacturer. We Basically, we have to use their attestation um, process. Uh, we hide that from you, so you don't need to worry. Um, but yeah, AS two fifty six in uh, in in the AMD uh, attestation. Lily, can you remember what it is for? That's for the encryption. Yeah, everything that's all, all of the algorithms that are used in these attestation processes are all uh, NIST compliant. They uh, the, the hardware vendors know that they need to sell this eventually to uh, to people that are bound by by NIST requirements, and so basically everything is NIST compliant. Thank you. Thank you. I think he was. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, so the solutions you've described sound perfect for uh, deterministic compute. Oh, they're just load. perfect. <laughs> yeah, sorry, carry on. But uh, <laughs> what about applications that want to do I/O or make syscalls or or anything, you know, more interesting? So. Um, there are, so let's, let me let me tackle the syscalls one first. Um, we actively uh, are disallowing anyone to make syscalls out. Right, we want to enforce a double barrier uh, on this technology. Um, Any time that you don't do that, which is precisely what SGX does by default, um, means that we, all you've done is created the perfect place to put malware. Um, if the if the if the guest in this case right or the tenant can do malicious things on the host without being detected, we consider that a very bad workflow and we don't want to enable it. So in terms of in terms of making syscalls, um, we are not going to allow raw access to that. On the other hand, we are going to allow things like networking. Uh, we are going to allow storage at some point in the future. We're, we're not there yet. Um, but the when we do offer things like persistent storage, the only thing that the host will see is going to be a block device. And there's going to be a block level encryption on top of it. And then inside the guest, you will see a file system that you can do file system I.O. on, but the host will never see that file system. And another thing, we are enforcing that all connections out, let's talk about the network connections out at the moment, are encrypted. There's going to be no uh, just plain, everything's going to be TLS encrypted. It's 
It's just the way it works. We're not so you're going to you're going to deliver your application right, usually bundled in a certain way with a certificate for that particular application, and then you can create TLS sockets using that uh, certificate, but you will not be allowed to just do TCP or UDP. Uh, we may allow that as a secondary mode where you get to keep all the bits if, it, if you lose your security, right? But the, the point is we want you to be able to write an application without doing special magic steps, and we remove a whole selection of our whole classes, set of classes of attacks. And, you know, there is no secure. We know there is no perfect security. We're not pretending there is. But we, what we want to do is we want to make it more difficult for you to do the wrong thing for developers who are not experts to create things which have the highest levels of security we can create without making it easy for them just to mess up. So that is what it is. You know, so they don't have to worry about the attestation. They don't need to worry about the encrypting it before it goes in. It just happens. This is an application deployment framework. That's what it's about. Sorry. Hugh. Can you talk about the variations in the different enclave technologies, which ones are more and less vulnerable. I know that people say SGX actually stands for stuff gets exposed or something else instead of stuff. Um, but uh, I know there's a wide variation there, and I thought it'd be interesting to hear about it. Yeah. Um, so there's generally speaking in the industry, there are two essential models. Uh, one is the what we're calling the process model, and the other one is the virtual machine model. Um, the, in the process module uh, model, you're basically going to carve out a specific section of your process. That pr uh, section is going to be uh, isolated and encrypted in certain ways according to that technology. And uh, but there's no two-way barrier. So the stuff that's inside of the keep can uh, not in NRCs, but inside of the secure area uh, can uh, can talk out, mess with the system. This would include uh, Intel SGX. Um, and uh, but w we believe the market is actually converging on the secure virtualization model. Um, it, it appears that um, everyone is either working on or uh, or has already released a secure virtualization technology. So we think that the market is going to converge on that technology. Um, the process model has some inherent weaknesses in that it's a completely new security model, right? We all sort of understand user separation. We understand process separation. We understand VM separation. These are all existing barriers that we are using every day. We're deploying them every day at very large scale. They're well understood. Um, the problem with the process model is that it comes along and puts a barrier right in the middle of a process, which is we've never done that before. And, uh, and so even if it can work, uh, we have uh, a long way before we really feel confident. Uh, as, that a, it, as a community. That yeah, is. as a community. Um, so I, I think the much shorter path to acceptance is by building secure VMs, because all we're doing with secure VMs is increasing the strength of an already well-known barrier. And I, I want to stress again that when we say VM, we don't mean a thing with a whole operating system in it. We just mean literally an empty VM into which we can decide what we stuff. Yeah. It's very, it is not one think of those. Think not a virtual do. operating system, think virtual CPU. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Any other questions? We still got a few minutes. If, uh, and I have, uh, I have stickers if you want them. Uh. Um, so when you're running code in a TE, what does the kernel see? Does, how does the memory management work? Does it see how? Like yeah. a process? Yep. Yeah. It looks like a well, process. Well, so the, the answer is that it, it sort of depends on the technology, whether it's process-based or VM-based. Um, in, the, in the case of a secure VM, um, it, the, the, the way hardware virtualization like KVM already works, right, is that you start up the CPU in this particular mode, and then there's a bunch of things that the CPU handles itself without ever exiting to the kernel. When it does exit in the kernel, we call this a VM exit, uh, and this allows the kernel to do things like emulate hardware or other things. Um, in NRX, it's our intention to develop our own custom hypervisor for this, not QEMU. Uh, and we already have, uh, as you've seen, some, uh, some, some demo of that. Um, and this is because we really don't want to emulate a lot of hardware. We want to give the, we want to have as few VM exits as possible. And there's some really interesting questions that are 
have not been decided yet in terms of exactly how things fit. So what does a unit kernel look like exactly? What yep. you base that on? And that's, that's the stage of the project we're at, which is why it's a great time to be involved. Because there's lots of interesting stuff to do. Um, so, uh, yeah. Everything's also currently coded in Rust. So uh, we do rely on the memory protections that the Rust language gives us, um, which means that uh, we also can have a higher degree of confidence uh, in the code itself. Any, oh, yeah, please. So when your when your code is executing, it runs on a CPU, and then you're done. You return to the user. Who runs on that CPU after? And are you worried about what they can see after you've run your? It's a, it's run on a virtual CPU that's encrypted, and then when your code is done running, that CPU goes away, and no one the ever. The virtual executes. CPU does, but the physical CPU. Correct. Right. I mean, it, on the hardware, it runs on let's say CPU 17, and I mean then mm -hmm. you're done. And somebody else gets CPU 17 yeah, to run e something after yeah, you. The, the, the AES key goes away. So all you get is encrypted garbage. You get encrypted oh. Yeah. Yeah. Are you worried about a pattern of someone watching encrypted garbage, or will that change from everyone, every... So, so statistical analysis of ciphertext is explicitly not within our threat model. Uh, we are essentially trying to reduce it to the fact that the only thing you can really do is statistical analysis, which nobody's really succeeding at. And, and clearly, anyway. you know, it would be possible for the chip vendors to have mis-implemented um, the instructions and all that sort of stuff, so they could get it wrong. And when it comes down to it, that's, you know, we, we can only do so much. We have to accept that threat model and, you know, feedback whatever we can to the, to the chip vendors. But this is one of the strengths of NRCs, right? Because if you have an application that you've written, you've compiled it to WebAssembly, you're deploying it with NRCs, and all of a sudden you discover that uh, chip vendor X has a huge vulnerability, you just redeploy on a different manufacturer, right? It's, there's, it's literally just deployment configuration in our model. So if you find something you're worried about, if you find you can't trust a CPU, just don't use that kind of CPU anymore. Are there any Risk V designs that include um, these features? There is an initial proposal from Risk V uh, called Sanctum. You can Google that, uh, and you'll you'll find the details of that proposal. Um, it's the Sanctum project is a process-based model similar to what Intel SGX does. Um, I really wish they would focus on the SecureVM model instead. Uh, we, we think that that's a, a better technology. But, uh, but we do plan to support it eventually. It's not high on our priority list right now. So just to, to finally, uh, oh, today, uh, to, to, to wrap up, this does not make for perfectly secure computing. Nothing makes for perfectly secure computing. What it does is it removes the number of trust relationships you need to maintain. It allows you to have greater assurance and cryptographic confidence in the bits that you do need to trust, either because they're from the chip vendor or because they're using open source, written in languages, which uh, we have a fair amount of trust in, which can be audited both at the code level, the like compile level, and also at the application level that we're providing. And um, web, WebAssembly <laughs> is key here because even if your code does something wrong, WebAssembly always faults in a predictable way, right? So even in the failure case, one of the benefits that WebAssembly gives us is a, a constant known mode of failure. So we'd love to talk to you more about this. You know how to get in touch with this. We'll be around for the next couple of days. I've got stickers. Go to enox.io. Uh, there's a uh, – you can put issues in there. You can look at the wiki. Uh, you can submit code. That would be great. So thank you very much indeed for your time, and uh, appreciate your coming along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.